And before we tackle the elephant in the room, let's work our way up with the more common and likely form of the question. The derivative of x raised to the power of x and that of x raised to the power of x raised to x. Starting with the former, the derivative of x raised to x. You will likely encounter two methods of solving this on the internet. Let's get those out of the way. For method one, we start by writing x raised x as the exponential of the natural log of x raised x. From the rule on the left, since the natural log of a solves for the power that when e is raised to will equal a, e when raised to the natural log of a will simply just be a. Moving forward, I will refer to the natural log as just log. So the natural log of a will be ln a. The natural log of x will be ln x, just for simplicity. Now let the variable u equal to x ln x. Taking the derivative of u, we have by the product rule on the left, du dx equal to ln x plus 1. Focusing on the derivative of x raised x and making the substitution for the value of u, and performing the differentiation using the chain rule on the left, we have solved for the derivative of du dx previously, and hence the chain rule evaluates to exponential to the power of u times ln x plus 1. Substituting our value of u back in, we find that the derivative of x raised x to be itself times ln x plus 1. That will be method 1. Next up, method 2. Letting the variable y equal x raised x, we apply a ln on both sides. The right-hand side, ln x raised x, allows us to bring down the power of x to create a product of x times ln x. Taking the derivative on both sides, the left-hand side evaluates to 1 over y times dy dx, and the right-hand side to ln x plus 1 by the product rule. Multiplying both sides by y, we now have dy dx equal y times ln x plus 1. Substituting y equals to x raised x back in, we once again have our answer. The derivative dy dx equals to x raised x times ln x plus 1, where y is equal to x raised x. That concludes method 2. For the derivative of x raised x raised x, we once again have two methods. Method 1 involves reusing the value of the derivative of x raised x just found, whilst method 2 assumes we did not evaluate that derivative prior. For method 1, let y equals to x raised x raised x. Taking the natural log on both sides, the right-hand side evaluates to x raised x times log x. Taking the derivative on both sides, the left-hand side evaluates to 1 over y dy dx. The right-hand side evaluates to, via the product rule, log x times the derivative of x raised x plus x raised x times the derivative of log x. Inserting the value of the derivative of x raised x just found, the right-hand side then expands to the following. Note the common factor of x raised x in yellow in all the three terms on the right-hand side. Factoring that out to neaten the equation, then multiply both sides of the equations by y, the left-hand side evaluates to simply dy dx. For the right-hand side, we substitute y for x raised x raised x back in. The two products at the front have the same base of x, hence their exponents can be summed under a common base of x giving us our answer, the derivative of x raised x raised x is equal to x raised to the power of x raised x plus x times ln x squared bracket squared plus ln x plus 1 over x. That completes method 1. For method 2, starting from whence we applied a natural log on both sides of the equation, instead of applying a derivative and solving the right-hand side using the product rule like we did in method 1, we apply a natural log again to both sides. We are trying to bring down the powers of the remaining x raised x term. The left hand side is now ln of ln y and the right hand side is now x ln x plus ln of ln x. Taking the derivative of both sides, the left hand side evaluates to 1 over ln y times 1 over y times d by dx. The right hand side by applying the product rule evaluates to ln x plus x times 1 over x, plus 1 over log x times 1 over x, tidying it up, then multiplying both sides by y log y, 
the left hand side is now dy dx and substituting the values of y equals to x raised x raised x back in bringing down the power of x raised x highlighted in yellow and summing the exponents of the terms with base x we once again have our answer and that concludes method two while unusual x raised x raised x and other variables with similar repeating powers can be expressed with the following superscript notation. The name for this type of mathematical operation is called tetration, and in this case, the variable x is tetrated to 3. Look, interview prep is important, but your CV gets you your first interview. Learn about unconventional tips to boost your CV as a STEM student so you land as many interviews as possible by clicking the link on the top right. Now back to the question. The name tetrated comes from the term tetra, derives from the Greek tetra, meaning the number 4. It is 4 because the operation is 4th in a sequence of operations beginning with addition, multiplication, exponentiation, and then tetration. Addition, like 2 plus n, is simply the addition of two ones repeated with n more ones. Multiplication, like n times 2, is repeated additions of 2, n times. Exponentiation, like 2 raised n, is repeated multiplications of 2, n times. While tetration, like 2 tetrated to n, is repeated exponentiation. Collectively, these operations are known as hyper-operations. The reason why we do not encounter them in traditional mathematics education growing up is illustrated well here. Take 2 raised 3. This is simply 2 times 2 times 2 being 8. Take 10 raised 3. This is simply 10 times 10 times 10 being 1000, a larger number but very manageable. Now take 10 tetrated to 2. This is 10 raised to 10, being 10 billion, a much larger number much, but still comprehensible. Now take 10 tetrated to 3. This is 10 raised to 10 billion. That's 1 with 10 billion zeros. For reference, 100 trillion is only 10 raised to 14. Numbers get large very quickly with this operation, and we are so accustomed to exponential increases as something that's really quick but this is one level of operation higher than exponential. There's practically no use cases for normies like us, hence it is likely unfamiliar to most of us. Finally, the elephant in the room, x raised x raised x raised x and so on for n times, or as we now know it to be called, x tetrated to n. At this point, I would like to introduce the proper notation to keep the equations neater, because trust me, from this point of the video onwards, things are going to get hairy. So buckle your seatbelts and go slow every wide if you need to. x raised to x is x tetrated to 2, with a superscript on the upper left of x, similarly for x tetrated to 3. The derivatives we have found before will prove handy, hence their notations are also updated as follows. Your interviewer, having asked you both forms of the derivative x tetrated to 2 and x tetrated to 3, now asks you if you think it's possible to find a generalized form for the derivative of x tetrated to any number n, the two derivatives found so far look similar in some ways, so it should be possible. Before proceeding, let's illustrate to prove to ourselves the values of x tetrated to 1 and x tetrated to 0, because this will come in handy later on. Starting from the following equation, ln of x tetrated to 3 can be shown to be a product of x tetrated to 2 times ln x. This is simply because of how logarithms allow us to bring down the powers. Generalizing this, we can see that the power when brought down is simply x tetrated to n minus 1. Now, we can solve for our special cases of n equals to 2 and n equals 1. When n equals to 2, we note that it can be shown that x tetrated to 1 is just simply x, because equating the two equations on the left and on the right, we can see that x tetrated to 1 is simply just x. Similarly, when n equals to 1, we note that it can be shown that x tetrated to 0 is simply just 1, by once again equating the two equations. Keep this in mind because they will be useful. From this generalized form, we take the derivatives on both sides, and the left-hand side and right-hand side evaluate to the following using the product rules. The left-hand side, the following, and the right-hand side, the following. Multiplying both sides by 1 over x tetrated to n, the left-hand side is simply the derivative of x tetrated to n, which is, the for which is the value that we're looking for. Now, we have obtained what is called a recurrence relationship because note how the derivative is also a function of the previous derivative term. That is to say, the derivative of x tetrated to n is a function of the derivative of x tetrated to n minus 1. Let's use these relationships to evaluate n equals to 4. 
substituting the values for n equals to 4, we get the following, that the derivative of x tetrated to 3 is also required as a function of the derivative of x tetrated to 4. This is the term highlighted in yellow. Since we have already evaluated this, we substitute the value in. And after some expansion, we obtain the sum of four terms, each a product of multiple smaller terms. At this point, we can see some patterns. There seems to be always products of x x's tetrated to a maximum of four. And there's always a long x term. And this seems to be increasing or changing uh, in their powers. So we are getting somewhere, right? Now we're going to try and figure out the pattern. And to do that, we shall first insert the following terms in yellow into the first two terms of these four term expansion. x over x. This is simply one, so we're not actually altering the values of these terms. This makes factoring out the one over x terms a lot neater. So factoring it out, note that since the last term is missing a long x, and noticing the pattern of decreasing powers of long x across the four terms from left to right here, it seems smart to just add in a long x raised to the power of 0 in the last term. This evaluates to 1, so once again, we're not actually altering any value. Returning to those extra x terms in the first two terms of these four-term expansion, we note that they can simply be written as x tetrated to 1, as we've proven uh, previously, shown on the top right in red. And for reasons that will be clearer later, we will also add an additional x tetrated to 0, but only to the first term of this four-term expansion, this evaluates to 1 as well, so we once again do not alter any values. For the sake of clarity, I reorder the terms. The last term is the first term, and so on. Nothing more. That's all this slide is. Let's now inspect the form of our expansion. There are two distinct patterns emerging, in green and in purple. And these will help guide us in guessing the form of our generalized equation. For the purple series, we can see from left to right, that it is a summation of ln x terms, each of these terms being raised to a different power, and these powers increment from 0 all the way to 3, and we note that 3 also happens to be 1 less than our, our current value of n equals to 4. Hence, we can assume that a summation of ln x terms should exist in a generalized form, as shown here. For each of the purple terms, they are multiplied by a product of x tetrated terms. So the powers of ln x terms increase, and the number of x tetrated terms also increase, albeit in decreasing orders of tetration. So left to right, we can see that it has been tetrated to 4 and 3, and then 4, 3, 2, and then 4, 3, 2, 1, and then 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hence, a product notation for each of the long x terms in the summation seems to be appropriate. Substituting the product no notation into our equation, we see that the operator has the following limits. The upper limit is a constant at 4, which is our value of n, and the lower limit decreases, corresponding to the increasing number of product terms that we observe. We can also observe that the powers of ln x start from 0 to 3, hence we can fill this in. So filling in the values of the limits for our generalized form, we are getting closer. Note for each term, the sum of the lower limit of the product j and the power of the ln x term i always seems to sum to 3, right? So from left to right, 3 plus 0 is 4, uh, 3 plus 0 is 3, 2 plus 1 is 3, 1 plus 2 is 3, 0 plus 3 is 3. Because 3 is 1 less than 4. And let's try to Using this, let's try to link i and j via this, uh, this relationship that we found. So i plus j, which is equal to 3, and then 3 is just equal to 4 minus 1. Hence, j, the lower limit of the parent notation, can be expressed as 4 minus 1 minus i, where i is the, is the index for the long x summation term. So substituting this into our general form, we get the following. Now, because n is equals to 4, and since n can technically be any number, right, which is what we're trying to prove, we arrive at the general form for the derivative of x tetrated to n. If you evaluate the above equation for the following values of n, 1, 2, 3, and 4, you arrive at the equations that we have calculated prior. But is this sufficient to know that the equation holds for all values of n? To show that, we are going to need to dive deeper and perform a proof by induction. The idea of the proof is the following. If the equation we have found holds for n equals to n plus 1, that is to say we simply substitute n for n plus 1 into the equation, then we can be sure that the equation holds. Shown here is how the generalized form will look like if we substitute n for n plus 1. Note the terms highlighted in blue. Beginning from the recurrence relation, we start with the derivative of x tetrated to n plus 1. This is simply substituting the value of n plus 1 for n into the recurrence relation. As we can see, it is a function of the derivative of x tetrated to n, the term highlighted in yellow. This is the general form that we have just derived. This general form 
when inserted back into the recurrence relation should allow us to rederive the general formula once more, just with an m plus 1 in place of n. If this can be done, the proof by induction is complete. Inserting the general form that we just arrived, highlighted in yellow, this is multiplied in its entirety by a long x term. We then factor out the 1 over x term as follows. The long x term is absorbed into the summation term. Each term within the summation has an extra long x, hence the power is now i plus 1 instead of just i. This is highlighted in yellow. Next, we multiply the x tetrated to m plus 1 term from the front. This is applied to both terms within the widest bracket. x tetrated to m plus 1 is now absorbed into the product notation, as seen by the changes in the upper and lower limit, highlighted in yellow. Instead of n, it is m plus 1. We have also added a long x raised to power 0 on the last term. This has a value of 1, so it does not alter any value, but it will come in handy. Swapping the positions of the first and last term, just for clarity, our equation becomes the following. The summation limits can be altered, since each summation term has an additional long x. This can be accounted for by just raising both the upper and lower limits by plus 1. This allows the power of the long x terms to just be i again instead of i plus 1. We can see now two terms within the widest brackets. The second one has a form close to that we are looking for, which is our general form with m plus 1 instead of n. But only the lower limit of the summation term is different, starting at 1 instead of 0. Let's focus now on the term circled in red. Can we somehow express this term into the form on the left? Doing so will allow our equation to be combined into a single form, hopefully our m plus 1 generalized form. Ln x raised to the power 0 can be re rewritten as the summation from 0 to 0, while products of x can be represented as the following product notation with the limits n to m plus 1. Combining it together, we add a minus i on the lower limit of the product notation, since i is 0 in this case anyway, so it doesn't change the limits. Evaluating this term for i equals to 0, we can see that it does evaluate back correctly. Now let's substitute this form back into our equation. The lower limits of the product notation seem different. j equals to m minus i against j equals to m plus 1 minus 1 minus i. But they are in fact identical. Both can be written as j equals to m plus 1 minus 1 minus i. With that, both terms can be combined by simply changing the limits of the summation that we have. What we actually have is simply the i equals to 0 term being separated from the collection of terms for i more than or equal to 1 up to m plus 1 minus 1. Combining them back together, we have completed our proof. Indeed, in each of the blue highlighted variables, it is simply replacing n with m plus 1 in our general form that we found. In our general form, the summation limit goes from 0 to m minus 1. Now, it is 0 to m plus 1 minus 1. For the products, it has an upper limit of m plus 1 instead of n, and the lower limit of m plus 1 minus 1 minus i instead of just m minus 1 minus i. Since the form is a function of long x, the domain of the function lies in x more than 0, since long x is undefined for x less than or equal to 0. The presence of the 1 over x term at the front also ensures that x cannot be equal to 0, since 1 over 0 is undefined. In addition, ln x raised to the power 0 equal to 1 is used a lot within our proof, and we assume it's valid. And since 0 to the power 0 is undefined, ln x cannot be equal to 0. But there are values for which ln x can be equal to 0, and that is x equals to 1. And since ln x cannot be equal to 0, that means x cannot be equal to 1. And hence, the general form of our derivative of x tetrated to n has the domain x more than 0, and x cannot be equal to 1. For more interview questions, click the playlist on the right.